This is No You Are Earth, and I am here today with Maddie Harland. Please introduce yourself, Maddie. I am Maddie Harland, and I co-founded Permaculture Magazine and Permanent Publications, which has published over a hundred books relating to regenerative culture and horticulture and agriculture. And I'm a co-founder also of the Sustainability Centre in Hampshire, which used to be a naval base yeah. and now is a thriving educational centre for people of all ages, even tiny. Brilliant. Especially tiny. Yeah, brilliant. Gosh, well, I met you, like, in the 90s, I think, which was when you had just started um, publishing the mm. magazine. Mm. And when I discovered permaculture, it was like an affirmation of the things that I could grow inside me yeah. of potential that were never, I never really understood in a, a, a mental way. I could just feel. And um, so permaculture looks at the patterns of nature and it sees how to apply those patterns to all systems of life. Yes. Please say more, Maddie. Okay. So, so we are living in time, times of great fear and emergency for many people. And permaculture is a framework for all sorts of tools and practices, both you know, ancient wisdom and traditional knowledge, but also new technologies and, and new knowledge. Yeah. So it's this combination of, of the past and then what will be future common sense practic practices yeah. pulled together in this toolkit that, that is based on, as you said, observing natural patterns and principles and then creating systems that don't pollute, don't create waste, don't lose um, unnecessary amounts of yeah. energy, don't separate all the nodes in a system and disconnect them. They, this is a, a practice of designing to reconnect, to create beneficial relationships, to make something as energy efficient as a woodland, a deciduous woodland, yes. that creates its own fertility and, and the yields within that fertility and cycles through four seasons to do that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, one of the things that I love about permaculture is that nature is the teacher. Yes. We've spent so many years, haven't we, like learning from gurus or apparent leaders or looking to them for guidance or, you know, how to do things, you know, making laws about this and that. Um, and yet nature... I feel is the one teacher that we can really trust. The one teacher with no hidden agenda. The one teacher that just embraces us exactly as we are. And also when we look at nature, you know, nature has got millions of years of evolution behind it. You billions. Know, nature, well, billions, <laughs> yes, of course, billions. But, but even in terms of our near history, even if you take just the the millions of years, you know, wildly beyond the, you know, the arrival of Homo sapiens. Yeah. And nature has taken those systems and, and that evolution and worked out what, what takes the minimum effort for the maximum gain. And, and yes. it's partly about survival, but there's this element of intelligent adaptation creativity you know, why why work really hard when you don't need to yeah why create a thread of a spider um, from organic materials that isn't incredibly strong if you want to cross a whole divide between two oak trees yes. you know why have scales on the back of a reptile who likes to be warm that don't shed water you know so so why would we design roofs that retain water mm. and retain um, stuff that just builds up moss and, and detritus and blocks our gutters? Yeah. You know, surely we want roofs that act like an like a reptile's yes. skin 
that that sheds the water, sheds the mm. the detritus, and just keeps it all so that it can be warm and clean and dry. Yes. And in these times when we are brought together, not as because we're just like one nation with a problem we are brought together as a global community now yeah. because of the challenges that we face so there are like wonderful things to this challenge and yet it can see, seem to be so huge and impossible to do anything about and yet because we are part of nature because we are not connected to nature that implies a gap of which there is no gap. Because we are nature, there is always something that we can do in our personal lives on a daily basis to contribute to this wonderful wisdom of creativity of nature that is flowing through us, isn't there? Yes, and because we're nature, we want to care for the earth. It's our natural place of existence. You yeah. know, being a destructive force on the earth is our unnatural, unhappy, disconnected, disempowered place. Yeah. When we're really yeah. genuinely in the flow of what we are as human beings, we are creative, adaptable, and we, we want to enhance and make better. We don't want to diminish and make worse. Yes. And that relates to our relationship with people as well. And resources and somehow we've got into this one plus one equals two pattern yeah which has a, a logic in terms of society but when you leave the one and you get to the equals two you've kind of left something behind and what we need is an evolutionary shift that takes us back into seeing um, all the elements of everything we're touching as being totally interconnected like a web like an ecology so permaculture is by its nature deeply holistic because it takes all the elements that we want to design into whatever we're designing whether it's a community process or a piece of landscape and it it it, it is recognizing and enhancing the connections the beneficial relationships yes the flows of energy rather than the loss of energy from a system. And also the, the deep ethic of care of the earth, care of people, and sharing, not only with the present generation, but with future generations. So it's deeply hopeful. It is deeply hopeful. And also it's not about someone coming into your life and doing a permaculture design for you. We are all designers, and the whole point is that we have the tools to design our way out of this mess. This is simply an evolutionary step away from linear, disconnected thinking into interconnected ecosystem-like thinking. Yes. And, and that's what we've got to do as humanity. We've yeah. just got to kind of, you know, just like we, we, we raised up our heads and created this extraordinary flowering of the prefrontal lobes. Somehow we've got to flower, not on a physical level, but we've got to flower into this large cerebral mass that yes. we're completely underutilizing yes. and start working with that sense of feedback loops and systems. So it is not okay to use all our coal in a matter of two centuries mm. and all our oil you know we should be treating fossil fuels which are carbon based compounds like we treat mm. well actually we shouldn't be treating them like diamonds because we're horrible to diamonds as well but we should be looking at these resources that we can use but in real with really careful stewardship yes and we we should be keeping them and saving them for when they're only absolutely ne necessary for future generations. At the moment we're just so focused on money, we just want to use everything up immediately. Yep. It's a bit like having a, a, a week's worth of food and gorging it in, in one lunch. Yes. And then being sick. Yeah. And I, you know, I really feel that um, 
in this time when we are so bombarded by the the by the news of all the things that are going wrong um and we are so well aware of the grief and how we should be and and that can really be an enormous weight on our shoulders the should on our shoulders you know can really bring us down so that we cannot move forwards in an effective way and so you know what but this is our big chance yes this because is everything's our big falling chance. apart because everything's unraveling everybody in the world even the linear money orientated people the materialists and the scientists are suddenly thinking hey come on a minute the system seriously isn't working and it's not only working for planetary biodiversity it's not working for humanity either yeah. and if we don't fix it soon it's going to be too late so this is a huge opportunity yes. to redesign culture yes on a global scale and not not by kind of greens colonizing yeah you know, this isn't it's about an, it's colonizing an inner, for me it, it feels like it's an inner transformation that we have to make for the outer transformation to have mm. any foundation mm. And what really cheers me about this is we could think, well, you know, 100% of the human population are not going to transform. But then there are, you know, traditional societies who already get ecosystems thinking because yes. that is how they survive. Yes. There are other societies who used to think that but only have only given up that way of thinking relatively recently. So it's deeply ingrained in their in them in their memory yes. and and even you know the most westernized um urban people we have it deep in our dna of course we because do. it's actually who we really are it is who we really are and i really have a sense that at this time you know not only do we have this dark sort of shadow side but with it we have this rising this new kind of flowering within us of that remembering mm of who we really are mm. so it's just one evolutionary step that's all it takes yes it's just a shift of paradigm away from linear resource-based consumption yeah into living in a state of awareness of the cause and effect of an interconnected web and it's actually what makes us happy it makes our hearts sing to live like that that's what we want to be that's what we long for yes. deeply as human yeah. beings that's why there's so much unhappiness and ill health and misery in the world because we 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 don't love and live on the basis of that kind of respect and loving kindness to all creatures mm. and sometimes it can seem hard to access that flowing creativity that is us that is nature moving through us and yet it is always here with every breath in and every breath out connecting us to every single cell in the body and connecting us to all people all life through all time that has been and that will come this is a magical moment it is and it doesn't take all of us it only takes a proportion of humanity to tip over into that kind of interconnected vision of how we need to live on this earth. Yes. So do you have a, a message for our viewers to uplift, to inspire, to give a, a clue to that breath of magic of now, to fill the mind with inspiration and hope? To empower us to go forth and ignite and inspire <laughs> so we, we we need to do some really simple things Great. we need to do things like spend time in nature if appropriate grow our own food have be in relationship with other human beings as well as the natural world don't just be a nature freak and not have friends seek seek people of like minds gather together share resources eat 
supper together on a regular basis. You know, build your community and, and build your resilience. And, and also, if appropriate, build your skill base. We, we are an ecosystem in ourselves. And not all of us are going to be experts in renewable energy or conflict re resolution in community or forest garden or food forest design or healing. You know, we all have our gifts and, and our capacities and our passions. So find the joyous passion that is there residing in your heart and, and feed it. Feed it for a regenerative world. And no, don't look for results. Just, just do what moves you deeply and makes you feel like you're fully inhabiting your potential. Don't, don't give yourself a dark arrow of comparison and say, oh, well, I've done this for 30 years and the world hasn't changed. Don't, don't do that. Just do it because it's the right thing to do and it feeds your imagination and your creativity. And that's all we can ask ourselves to do. Maddie Harland from Permaculture Magazine. <laughs> thank you very much for your wisdom and thank you for your work in the world of bringing forth these ideas that you share with people all over the world. Thank you for your persistence and your dedication, your commitment, and your vision. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mary Jane.